Mistake number four, dubious proofs of the Trinity from reason. They usually nowadays take this form. God is love, therefore God is a Trinity. It sure would be nice if there was a way to show that all non-Christian theologies are incoherent. They say that their God is perfect and that God is perfectly loving, but then their views also imply that God is not perfect and he's not perfectly loving. And the reason they imply this is because their God is a single self, a single person. Only a triune God can be love or perfectly loving. On this point, some people are serious, but most aren't. Augustine of Hippo, the ancient North African bishop, gestured at an argument like this in one of his writings. He suggested the father would be somehow deficient, such as greedy or ungenerous, if he didn't eternally generate the son. This type of argument played no role in the formation of the official formulations. You do see an unclear type of argument like this in Augustine but I'm not aware of anywhere else it is in ancient writings. I'd be surprised to find it anywhere else. You see this type of argument touted by the medieval theologian Richard of St. Victor in his book called On the Trinity. Richard of St. Victor was a Scottish monk who was active in the 12th century. Several years back, my co-bloggers and I at the Trinity's blog did a long series of posts where we went through a lot of these arguments. In my own view, they're not very good arguments. They're fairly slapdash the way they're put together. In my view, the people who have best argued this point are Richard Swinburne and Stephen Davis. These are contemporary, well-respected Christian philosophers. I don't think that those arguments work either, but they have developed them much better than Augustine and much better than Richard of St. Victor. I discussed these arguments in a book chapter of mine called On the Possibility of a Single Perfect Person. What the argument's trying to show is that if you suppose that there is a perfect single self, that that's impossible. And the line of thinking in popular writings is usually, God is perfectly loving, so therefore he must eternally and independently of creation be engaging in the best kind of love. But then there must be another person within the divine nature for God to love. If God was a single person, then apart from creation, he'd only be able to love himself. And that's not the best kind of love, so God wouldn't be perfectly loving. The problem with these arguments is that I think they have a fallacy at their heart. It's this. God is perfectly loving only if God is perfectly loving. If I paraphrase that, I think you'll see why there's a fallacy there. What they mean is that God has the character trait of being a perfectly loving being only if God is actually loving someone else. But of course, you can have the virtue of being a perfectly loving being and not be actually loving anyone else. Because being perfectly loving is a character trait, it's not an action. Imagine that you have a castaway who's abandoned alone on a desert island is he an honest guy? Is he disposed such that he will tell the truth to others? He may be an honest guy, but never have a chance to manifest that honesty. Is he compassionate? Is he disposed so as to care about when others are doing poorly? Sure, he might be, but he never actually has a chance to engage in compassionate actions or words while he's a castaway on a lonely desert island. It seems to me these arguments just don't get off the ground at the very first step. Never mind how we get that there are exactly three divine persons. I don't see how you get from one to two, because I think you could be perfect in every way and be a single divine person. And yes, you could be perfectly loving as a part of that. And I don't think that you would be lonely or inadequate in any other way. As far as I know, this is where in the whole history of Christianity you see these type of arguments. In Augustine in the early 5th century, Richard of St. Victor in the 12th century, Richard of Oxford in the 20th and 21st centuries, and a few people inspired by him, like William Lane Craig and Stephen T. Davis. That makes this a tiny minority view among serious Trinitarian thinkers. Why is that? I think it's because it's not a convincing argument. But another reason could be this. The argument seems to make the most sense if the persons of the Trinity really are persons, that is, so many selves. Typically, with a person like Davis or Swinburne, 
The conclusion of this argument is that there are multiple selves in the one God. If you're a one-self Trinitarian, or if you're the type of Trinitarian who doesn't think that we can to any extent understand how the one God is, and so you just refuse to think of selves there, whether one or three, if you're one of those kinds of Trinitarians, you're not going to like these arguments because they have an unwelcome conclusion. Their conclusion is, in your view, a wrong-headed way of understanding the standard Trinitarian language. There are other dubious proofs. Sometimes people will riff on some of Augustine's many analogies. Father's like a soul, the son's like his mind, the spirit is his love for himself, things like that. Then people tend to ignore that Augustine thinks that these are all bad analogies. He tries them all out, kind of plays around with them, and then really kind of abandons them. He doesn't think that they're helpful in the end, at least not individually. 